Hey, greetings, fellow nerds, and welcome to another edition of Between Two Nerds. I'm Jeff Doyle, and with me is my friend and co-host, Jeff Tansura. Good morning, Jeff. I guess it's still morning where you are. Yeah, it is. Good morning, Jeff. Good morning, everybody. Great to see everyone here. And uh, uh, we, we will wait for a few more minutes for uh, our esteemed guest to join. He has some uh, power issues. So what's going on, Jeff? Oh, man, just uh, um, just enjoying life here and enjoying the winter weather. Um, uh, you know, uh, being in California, you don't know about winter weather, but... Uh, <laughs> yeah, the weather has been really weird. I mean, we had really summer weather, high 70s last week, and today we were probably 35. So it oh, man. Yeah. Jumped and it's, really been, it's been in single digits here for the last couple of days. Wow. But uh, yeah. Yeah. So um, uh, had a little family issue last time, and I, I missed the show, but I, uh, I did watch the show uh, with you and Dima. And um, um, and it, it was a, a terrific discussion. And there's uh, as as soon as he joins us here, um, we can continue with that discussion. But uh, maybe it's worth recapping a little bit, uh, um, if nothing else, for my sake. Uh, I know I know the discussion sort of left off with talking about uh, ECMP and MPLS networks. Yeah, so the interesting point, as we speak, uh, there's a draft in ATF called LARP or labeled ARP, surprisingly, that's yep, in that's uh, adoption call. And it actually describes how on boot up a host can receive not only IP address, but also label to reach its upstream. Mm -hmm. uh, so it had been kind of in limbo for a long time because it doesn't have IPv6 part. Because IPv6 doesn't use ARP obviously right yeah. but uh so now we are trying to progress it actually was driven by uh people from yandex to my memory and kiretti mm -hmm. uh when they were trying to build mpls on the data center and i'll let dima to talk about this more but practically the idea is that when you boot up host it has not only ip address and default gateway potentially to reach its upstream but also label so it can start encapsulating traffic in MPLS immediately, which has uh, just a second. We need to send a link to Dima. Uh, a link, a link for how to join the show is always a good thing to have. Yep. Okay, so this work is progressing, and even so, most people haven't deployed MPLS and data center for a variety of reasons. In early days, MPLS wasn't really supported by Merchant Silicon. Then it was difficult to deploy. Then we didn't really have open source software to, to do MPLS properly. Mm -hmm. But for now, things may change. Yeah, I, in fact, I, I noticed on the uh, YouTube channel there was a question exactly about that uh, from from one of the viewers of, of what is the state of, of MPLS within the data center. So the real question, why would you do MPLS, right? So traffic yeah. engineering in data centers is extremely complicated and ECMP outside of high-performance compute works really well. Right, yeah. as long as your flows are not like forty percent of your upstream bandwidth, you are okay. As, as you move to machine learning, the flows are very different. Yeah, yeah. you, you, you it, could it, have four hundred gig upstream and hundred gig really long lasting flows when you do kind of inference at scale. So, but this kind of topic for another discussion, Jeff. Yeah. Yeah. So, you know, when, I mean, when you're talking about all that, is is that outside of the scope of uh, EVPN or, uh, or I should, yeah, outside the scope of EV, EVPN or as part of it? Because, um, you know, part of what was going around in my in my head, um, you know, when I saw that question was, you know, well, it, hey, Dimitri. <laughs> Hey, good morning. Sleepy cat. 
<laughs> Can you hear us? Okay, let them uh, finish setup. Uh, so, uh, in most hyperscaler data centers, there is no EVPN, right? The the control plane is usually some kind of uh, large distribution bus, and it's usually to the host. Yeah. Right. So the overlay starts at the host. You've got uh, middle layer. Uh, in most cases, completely uploaded into hardware. So it's very well known how AWS uses Nitro to do this. It's less known what we do at Microsoft. It's not known what Google is doing. They're not talking about it. But practically, in most cases, there's a piece of hardware. Might be an SDA. Might be a uh, smart niche. Might be some kind of very optimized hardware specifically for networking and it provides a separation between uh, host os and host networking and yes and this is where you apply your policies your security this is where you distribute your ip and mac addresses bindings and all the stuff so practically in most cases it's absolutely invisible for the public if we look at the enterprise space it's completely the opposite in most cases you would have uh, EVPN as control plane for overlay. It would use VXLAN in 99% of the cases. We've seen first some very early usage of uh, Genève. Potentially, <coughs> EVPN is completely decoupled from data plane cancellation use. So you could use anything as long as you've got tunnel from ingress to egress, right? So, I know these two spaces use very different technology. This is some merge. merge. Uh, we've seen on vendor side uh, some mapping services that replace VPN. So you just use VPN, some kind of distribution bus to distribute all this data rather than using BGP. Uh, we've seen some VPN deployments on hyperscaler side, mostly in niche cases, but it is there. VMware is widely supporting VPN. So they started with routing only. We see more and more support there. So I, I would say there are some conversions between these two. In some cases, BGP works really well. In some cases, less well. But, you know, it's not black and white anymore. Sure. Hey, Dima, can you hear us? Can you speak? Hey, yeah. Okay. Should work both ways. Morning. Morning. <laughs> so I think at this point, we will try to start where we stopped last time and continue the discussion. Uh, yeah, and if there are some questions, probably we should uh, answer those questions before continuing. Uh, we received a few questions on LinkedIn. I believe Laura asked for the slides. Okay. Uh, well, yeah, I can provide slides uh, used version because the presentation is at actually a mix of different topics. So yeah, so if I you could share know. anything, please. Uh... No problem with that. Yeah, I wouldn't mind having a, having a copy of the slides myself. Yeah, sure. And sure. Uh, I think there was another question about uh, none of presentation you were referring to, whether it was presentation from Chris or some other actually I didn't uh, could you give me some more context uh, which nano presentation uh, I think uh, in routing section you had referral to my memory at least it was uh, reference to Peter's presentation uh, I probably mentioned uh, both Peter presentation but that was at NSDI and if you are talking about nano well, it, I guess it's in it your slide, was so. about uh, routing and dense topologies. It's probably yeah. Tony Lee. Okay, so uh, if you could, uh, we'll do it offline. Sure. Yeah. Uh, I will probably do this uh, just in case. Yeah. Okay, so uh, I we stopped pretty much around the CMP. We discussed the CMP and MP networks and MPLS and uh, implications with regards to next subgroups and how when you use MPLS, your next group suddenly become really, really serious issues. So yeah. this is where we stopped and 
this is where and we briefly discussed uh, yeah. the difference between a CMP for IP and for MPOS, and the problem is MPOS scaling in a CMP environment, which is applicable not only to data centers, actually. Yeah. So um, I will try to bring some slides, I guess. Uh, but uh, what I wanted to talk about is also we bring traffic to data centers and out of data centers. So basically, uh, the design of uh, interconnect between D data center and wide area, some edge uh, topologies, and probably how to connect serial data centers together. And um, also probably that's a very niche topic, but um, I can talk briefly about uh, consequences. Basically, what kind of problems uh, arise when we do disaggregation? Well, aggregation and then we, uh, in uh, multi-pass topologies and then something fails and we have to do, for example, conditional disaggregation. It's a very good topic and uh, not always well understood before you hit and black hole, right? So making our listeners aware of uh, consequences of, of aggregation place where it shouldn't be, it would be very good to go with this presentation. Yeah, yeah sure. So, I'll try to share. Uh, yeah, so uh, yeah, a lot of text, but uh, I, I have a nice picture after that. So uh, can you see the slide? Yeah. Yes. Yeah. So basically, we have our uh, nice data center network and how we um, connect it to the outer world, how we bring traffic in and how we uh, bring traffic out of data center uh, where and where to connect that one. So uh, basically uh, we are using a dedicated module in the data center, which we call forward. Uh, but uh, there are other options. Uh, for example, it's possible to uh, connect some edge routers to the top of fabrics and basically inject the traffic from the top of course network. Uh, one of the considerations is that uh, we really prefer to inject traffic symmetrically. Uh, so all external traffic is balanced across the entire course topology and across all the top of fabric switch. And uh, that basically drives uh, the decision where to connect. Because if fabric is relatively small uh, and number of top of fabric devices in our case, spine two devices is small. It's probably okay to connect each routers to top of fabric. But if number of top of fabric devices is really large, that would mean that we need uh, each routers with really high number of interfaces, uh, because basically uh, connecting uh, each router to all the top of fabric devices is not fe feasible. That means we probably need some intermediate layer and then it's uh, just easy uh, to dedicate to one or several modules in, in the fabric, I mean groups of uh, spine one switches, uh, pods, uh, and instead of connecting to top of the uh, rack 
uh, switches to them connect each routers. Uh, and another possible option, especially if uh, we just want to uh, connect, uh, for example, cell data centers together uh, in kind of data center kind, of, is uh, introduce something like extra spine level. Uh, it's a sort of thing Facebook is doing with HGrid and, if I remember correctly, Fabric uh, Aggregator uh, doing mostly the same thing. HGrid uh, definitely the same. Uh, that kind of decision also depends on what we are doing on the edge of data center because uh, if traffic just goes through that edge, but there, there are now functions, we are not doing some in cup decup and so on, then um, it's really flexible what we can do and not many restrictions. But if we are doing uh, some kind of uh, encapsulation manipulation or want to apply some filtering function, uh, then we have a set of devices which essentially uh, uh, looks like a membrane between uh, two parts of the network data centers and the rest of the world. And uh, no matter which path uh, the traffic goes, it has to cross that membrane. Uh, that means extra functions and extra touch points and all the state associated uh, with those encapsulation, decapsulation, filtering, or whatever. And of course, uh, we need to maintain that state and probably synchronize that state between devices. So. Uh, I would like to add a few points here, which I yeah. kind of learned in my last job. Uh, number one is MaxSec. So very often, as you leave your data center, MaxSec becomes pretty much mandatory. I mean, any traffic that's in movement needs to be uh needs to be encrypted and again it's becoming pretty much mandatory and uh, if you look at devices that support max in line usually you'll end up with somewhat more expensive silicon so on merchant side of things would be jericho or kumran allowed silicon uh on commercial vendors again wouldn't be uh low end or what we call data center scale silicon, right? So, which might eventually decide or drive you to decision to use different kind of uh, silicon, different kind of chassis. Another point is the distance in data centers is, you know, you are within rack, so it's probably what meter, meter and a half. Uh, if you need to traverse from one pot to another, probably a few hundred meters. The latency is different, but still within particular boundaries. As you go up towards your next aggregation level, we are talking in most cases uh, uh, two millisecond or one millisecond RTT, so up to 100 kilometers. In this case, potentially you would need more buffer space, more than few milliseconds usually provided, which might again change your perception not perception it's the wrong word change your choice of silicon and potentially drive you into more expensive silicon as well as chassis uh so in this case so we discussed it many times with jeff Doyle in the beginning usually in enter enterprise space if you try to interconnect data center the best thing to do is to implement edge pod and use all the multipassing available across fabric to exit it's also where you keep the complexity, right? You This is where you keep uh, stitching or, as Dima mentioned, different kind of NCAP decaps functions. Uh, it's good to have them in, since centralized in edge pod. If you're kind of larger and you have this additional layer of networking above data center, suddenly doing it in one pod edge is just not realistic, which might drive you to uh, interconnection of super spines to the outside or one fabric. Yeah, I agree pretty much on all the points. And it's true that, uh, especially in modern world, uh, MaxSec, once we go outside uh, tightly controlled infrastructures, basically outside the building is pretty much a requirement. And probably it's a requirement inside 
that depends. But once we go outside, it's pretty much a requirement. Fortunately, uh, Max Head is sort of coming to cheaper silicon over time. But still, it's usually a more expensive, more functional silicon. And yes, if we, uh, for a number of reasons, decided that we want to build an each port, it's a good place to have um, more functional devices there. Also, uh, each port is is a good place to keep services which require, for example, any cast. If we don't want to introduce all, all the any cast prefixes into the entire data center infrastructure, uh, it's probably a good idea to keep them inside each port or two. Well, there is no reason to have only one each port, and uh, we usually design it for two, uh, so we can bring like. So optical lines and external connectivity to at least two different each ports uh, inside the in data centers, which are also physically separated. Um, yeah. So, and uh, this basically picture showing what uh, happens with traffic, uh, how it's balanced if it enters each port on the lower left and it goes to, to and from some. Uh, top of the X-Switch, for example, on uh, lower right. And it, it's easy to see that it's uh, pretty much evenly distributed across uh, the entire top of fabric. And here it, what happens if uh, we bring the traffic from the top of fabric, but we don't have, for example, enough radix on each router to connect all the top of fabric switches, uh, then there will be some asymmetry. Uh, which sometimes it's okay, but uh, generally it's not a good thing because uh, some devices are going to affect external connectivity more than others, and there is less path diversity, and some links uh, will be uh, more overloaded than others. And uh, also, uh, going back to points you just mentioned, uh, is that yes, each port is uh, a place where uh, traffic with different uh, traffic flows with different RTTs probably co uh, coexist on the same links. And uh, generally, we need larger buffers. Uh, I'm not a big fan of really large buffers, but uh, inside data centers, we, we are talking about microseconds because it's like one microsecond per 100 meters and probably uh, roughly half microseconds for delay per switch. If we are talking about single switch chips, uh, chip, uh, single chip switches and empty queues, of course. So, uh, even around trip time inside data center is probably within 10 microseconds. Uh, until we we start to fill queues, but once we go outside, it's millisecond per hundred kilometers. So that means uh, several milliseconds or several dozens of millisecond round trip time, order of magnitude more. And of course, we we want uh, at least some degree of fairness between uh, traffic flows with different uh, round trip times. That mostly depends on congestion control, but we still need some buffer space also. Yeah, there is also cases. So, looking at this size, it's in most cases multi planner design, right? So, you've got more than one plane. And uh, on failure, it's very transitory, but still, till BGP converges, you might be sending traffic up where your plane converge if they do it at all. But in most cases, they do somewhere on top of your, in one fabric, for example, right? So you've got some flows that go from uh, pot to pot throughout super spine layer, but some where there's a failure will go up to the fan fabric and back. This is again, when you would potentially need larger buffer to accommodate this, uh, probably a few hundreds of milliseconds uh, traffic that normally wouldn't go there. No. Uh, by the way, um, you mentioned multi-point apologies. Uh, 
Multipoint is that essentially it's a way to represent it or to think about it because on this picture, its uh, topology is flattened, but uh, it's actually multiplane and planes are just shown in different colors of devices. So like yellow and green, and cyan, um, what's that? Violet, uh, all, the, all those are just different planes. It just was uh, more illustrative to flatten it out to show traffic patterns. So quick recap, I think we covered it in uh second or third show in multiplanar topology, the only merging point within data center, usually it's the leaf or top of rep. This is where you have exposure into every plane. And uh, if you use default routes, you'll receive default routes from every plane. You'll choose one based on local hashing, and then you stay within your plane. Because from the point of view of a top of the X switch or each router, which See the very bottom of the, of the network. Uh, each point is essentially a composite switch. It, it likes it just have a several links to different switches, but each switch inside is actually a leaf spine topology. It's built recursively. Uh, and uh, I have some slides in the beginning of the presentation describing just that. So I will provide the presentation, and if somebody insisted, it will be there. And uh, just uh, for completeness, that's, uh, that's a picture borrowed from Facebook. Uh, and here, uh, each block is essentially that uh, big class fabric with two spine layers. And what's between them, it can be considered additional spine layer. And it's good if it, we are not doing any uh, like functional transformation and come to cut. We just want to provide a lot of bandwidth between uh, several similar. Uh, it's all usually not exactly the same, but similar cost apology of similar size, similar scale, and all, all we want is uh, lots and lots of bandwidth. Yeah, and it's but not unique to Facebook, I should say. In, I mean, at particular size and scale, this is how you're going to do it. You you would like to always be able to scale out horizontally rather than building this vertical silos. Yeah, exactly. Actually, it's uh, uh, in terms of routing design or logical design, it's probably the easiest option uh, because it just more devices and more levels, but it's essentially scaling uh the same data center fabric design uh, but um, when we're talking about like physical packaging and actually implementing it, it, it there are some issues because it's a lot of fiber a lot of devices and so on That's probably it uh, with this presentation. And I want to go to some pictures describing the problem with uh, aggregation and multipass topologies. Yeah, so before you leave, a uh, few advice here. Number one, make sure you actually early in the design phase, uh, tag all your routes. You really want to have really good scheme with communities that identify any type of your services, because this is where you're going to use it. I know Facebook is using hundreds of communities. We are using Microsoft hundreds of communities. If you are trying to implement some kind of policies, communities is really the best way to unambiguously identify source of the routes and what you would like to do with them. Uh, eventually at this kind of size, you would also need to decide what states regional, what goes out, for example, to the edges. Again, communities here are extremely helpful. You really don't want to look into prefix list or something that uses your IP address identity. You use, you would like to have higher level metadata that identifies the routes independently of uh, its context. So use communities, think ahead of how your community schema is going to look like you're going to be needing them as you grow up. Yeah, no, I totally agree because no matter how accurate uh, 
and how forward looking you are going to be with your address planning addresses is, is not something graphic policies, uh, some high level abstractions communities should be used. Um, can you see slides? Not yet. Uh, something's coming up. Oh, yeah. Okay, it's, it's taking some time. Uh, so let's briefly go and talk about uh, aggregation and disaggregation and multi homing also. Yeah, I, actually, that's one, one more topic I wanted to talk about uh, also is uh, how to do multi homing uh, it's a presentation which was done for the Rift group, but it's not specific. Uh, so what are the problems and uh, why some of them are sometimes difficult to solve, for example, with BTP, but they're just generally uh, a little bit difficult to solve. It's, it's in canonical factory or post topology, every level is uh, completely disjoint. There's no horizontal connectivity within the level, any one of them. Uh, I mean, uh, if we remove all the spines and only look at the top of the rack level or the leaf level, uh, all, all the switches are isolated. And the same with spine one level, same with spine two. Uh, and reference to Rift, uh, we've had Tony P here for probably three or four different episodes. Uh, yeah, I have seen details. Them. Please go watch them. He also talked about uh, conditional disaggregation in details. Sorry, please continue. Yeah, sure. Um, we also discussed it in the first episode how multi stage calls is constructed, so probably can skip it. And that's, by the way, how it's recursively constructed. Uh, so why do we aggregate? Usually because we want smaller routing and forming state, uh, potentially small bus radius. Um, and with smaller routing and forming state, uh, there is also a potential to have smaller charm because basically small state, small number of updates. Uh, but uh, the difficult problem is how to aggregate multi-bus routes. Uh, in dataset network, what we usually have is that, uh, for example, if we use a default route or aggregate for entire DC end, it, uh, and we start from the lowest level, then or aggregate point north towards upper level spines, and it, but uh, actual route propagates southward fabric and then down or south. Uh, if you are talking about small aggregates, uh, when do they appear? They appear when we want to do host multi-homing or when we want to have an aggregate for single pod and so on. Uh, and such aggregates, they propagate up towards the uh, top of fabric and then they are reflected and propagate back south. Uh, so when, what is the reason and when we need to disaggregate? Uh, if we have multi paths and multiple uh, physical destinations covered by single aggregate, by some remote fails, then some nodes uh, originate in such an aggregate or pointed to by such an aggregate. Uh, may not actually have uh, reachability towards uh, individual destinations covered by such an aggregate after payroll. So we design our network, it's very symmetrical, it's nice, 
the, uh, now work holding, but failures happen, and then it's possible that there are work holes. And uh, in course, what's interesting is that uh, there are kind of remote failures that make some parts of the topology invalid for some, but not all of the destinations. And uh, in course, actually, when we're going up or north, it's a, a narrow available part of the topology. For example, once we go from top of the rack up uh, to the spine one, we selected our plane. We cannot go to another plane. So the further we go up uh, or north, uh, the, the more narrow part of topology we can actually use after that. Uh, so, very basic option, and it works nice if uh, for the table scale is okay with that. It's just always disaggregating it, everything. There probably will be a more dynamic routing table, more churn, but there will be no work holes. And since we managed to reduce the number of prefixes, that's uh, what we are actually doing. Uh, but uh, if uh, there are more prefixes per switch, for example, or it might not, not be the option. Uh, and also, uh, I'm discussing that with on aggregates, but also with multi homing And if you are talking about aggregates and multi homing uh, not everything can be decided on, uh, based on the local information. Because, uh, for example, we're sitting at some switch uh, and uh, below it, uh, we are not an aggregate, but do we need to inject and propagate some other nodes in the, on the same level, in the same groups? Uh, lost their, uh, the reachability to those destinations, basically. Uh, we can reach them, so we can uh, inject specific and attract the traffic. Uh, do, we don't have any direct links to our uh, neighbors within the same level, so there is no way to know uh, their state. And even if we had, because that's sort of traditional, for example, door homing design in layer uh, two architectures where we have a couple of switches like multi chassis lag and some links between the nodes, but it's never perfect because we, we don't know uh, with 100% assurance whether it's neighbor failed or our controlling failed. Uh, there are always some um, uh, corner cases. But uh, it's easy if we start completely disintegrated, it's kind of a worst case all the time. Or if we now like full set of destination in advance distribute all nodes, which is not really feasible. Uh, and um, it's basically the same as I already described, but with some pictures. Uh, here we have some failure between uh, within the CN plane between and spine two nodes. And uh, no, not the link, it's, it's a node failure. And uh, we want to reach some nodes and it makes uh, basically on some spine one nodes, we cannot uh, use default anymore. And uh, if we have a remote failure, like on lower level, for example, of spine one level or on the link between top of the rack switch and spine one switch, what's interesting is that now not any leaf or, or tor can use default route. Uh, because uh, if you use default, uh, we have like a 50 percent chance to select the plane which is not connected to our destination top of the rack. Illustration: What happens if we rely on default or like data center level aggregates and 
uh, if the original idea was to keep forward state on leaves which were small. Uh, it works uh, when topology is perfectly symmetric, no failures, but once it has failures, it loses symmetry. And uh, now we, we cannot use default anymore. And uh, there are more uh, spine level situations. It's essentially the same, but there are more cases depending on how high or how all the topology uh, things happen. But uh, with modern, really high radix switches, usually most deployment don't need more than two spine levels. But historically, for, for example, look at uh, what Google was doing uh, and describing in Jupiter Rising paper, they, at that point in time, um, Chipsets had smaller radix and smaller number of links, uh, so they were building uh, topologies with a uh, high number of levels. Uh, not going to go through this math, but uh, another thing is that uh, what if you want to do host multi homing? I'm not going to discuss layer 2 multi homing because it essentially kills all the scalability, but there are some reasons uh, to want to do layer 3 host multi homing. Uh, and uh, one of the scenarios we discussed, and um, we haven't deployed it, but uh, we made a prototype and it's working. Uh, so what we do, there is a number of hosts connected to a home to a pair of top of the rack switches, a pair of leaves. Each leaf originates the same aggregate prefixes covering all the hosts below them. But that only until something fails. Uh, when and if something fails, Lyft just doesn't have enough local information and it cannot figure out if it, the host is really dead, because if host is dead, uh, there is no reason to do anything. Aggregate is still perfectly fine because it covers all the uh, live hosts and that host is dead anyway. Or it could be that host just lost one of the uplinks. And then in this case, we want to attract traffic to the remaining uh, switch which has connectivity. But switch cannot really make that decision based on local information, but host can because host actually sees uh, which of the uplinks is alive. And we are assuming that we want to have very free routing and very free route propagation. It's kind of different situation because what Facebook, for example, doing is that in case of failure, they allow to have uh, uh, routes and traffic to bones uh, down and back again within the port. So. Uh, we are considering the case where we don't want to do traffic reflection within the port. So specifically to Facebook, I think it's important to, again, for people to know, in some cases you actually might want to do reflection. I think we'll cover it in more details in another episode, but practically uh, Facebook is using communities to keep routes from zigzagging. If you are using your vendor solution, I don't know, Cisco, Cumulus or something else, Usually, you can configure how many times an IS could be duplicated in IS pass. So if you use, uh, I think, exact CLI, something like allow ISN in, and then you can provide a number. So if you use number one, for example, it allows it to reflect once, but when it goes back again, because it will eventually, uh, and uh, receiving BGP speaker analyzes IS pass, it will see that ISN, its own ISN is now twice in the IS pass. So it will drop the route due to uh, uh, due to loop prevention, right? So this kind of allows you naturally to mitigate the effect of non uh, value free routing. So zigzagging is limited just to a single zigzag. Yeah, yeah, uh, exactly. Because otherwise it's bouncing, bouncing up and down and uh, and your path for, hunting uh, will become really serious. Probably. Yeah, it manifests itself as a path hunting, which we don't want. And 
uh, one of the uh, cardinal cases, if we do disagre conditional disaggregation based on what host sees, is that it's possible to have massive specific route injection uh, as a transient event. For example, uh, when DCA is uh, going up and powers up because not all the switches, not all the top of the, uh, all the lift switches are coming up exactly at the same time. And it's possible that uh, each host will see that it has only one uplink alive at some point and will try to inject uh, its own specific route because from the point of view host, it looks like uh, there is some pressure fire on the network. It doesn't know that it's just uh, coming up. It will try to inject a specific, and for example, if it's like module of data centers coming up with several thousands, or even several hundreds of hosts, and all of them are injected specifics, it's not very really good for the routing system. So those corner cases should be designed around, and usually there should be some waiting time and probably some uh, for up suppression, like uh, algorithms or uh, for up links, uh, also suppress it after a few flaps. And uh, here is how it looks like. Uh, we have a similar topology, but uh, now our hosts are door hold, and for example. Uh, there are switches A and B for, uh, for each host, and switch B goes down. Uh, well, if switch B goes down and I switch, then uh, well, no problems with that, except for each host is uh, trying to reject the specific. Um, but, well, leaf A, which is still alive, it doesn't know that B is down and it can actually suppress specific crowds. So no, that's a problem I mentioned. But if link, only one link, for example, uh, coming down, for example, between X and uh, host X and switch B, then host X will reject specific and uh, the remaining hosts uh, will not do anything. And we will have aggregates uh, announced from both switches and then specific route from host X uh, announce it from X and through A, and basically that does exactly what we want. So uh, I think it would be good to provide some uh, kind of summary here. Uh, so how to do things right. Uh, if we look at modern silicon, most of it can give you 100k plus routes today. So uh, if we are looking at BGP on the data center, uh, you would in most cases have your BGP session anchored to physical interfaces between switches, meaning you don't need to propagate them because in eBGP case, you would always reset next hop as route propagates, right? So you would only need to know local information to resolve routes recursively. You don't need to propagate them, which limits number of connected routes to number of really links. So in most cases it would be like 64, so there are 31. Right, so this doesn't contribute a lot of routes, it doesn't propagate. So most of your routing information in the fabric coming from leaves where your customers or your servers are connected to. So one consideration is make sure space is aggregatable. So what you advertise from a leaf is hopefully single or maybe two subnets. Number two, in some cases, you would connect some external parties into your fabric. Please make sure that they don't advertise their address space into your underlay. You really don't want this to happen. There's overlay for that. Keep it limited to your overlay. Number three, if you are using any cast, use it as any cast. Don't try to do active standby. If you use something like pass prepending, you will actually see the uh, convergence time going up up to 10 seconds because your primary path will be propagating all the way to the switch that connects standby and due to uh, uh, best path selection actually 
make other switches to withdraw uh, standby prefix. So it will take all the time to propagate standby back to the intersection point where your standby becomes better, right? So uh, lesson learned on this one. It takes really seconds and seconds to propagate. Use any cast just with the same priority. Use it active, active. And if you need to, uh, to do maintenance or remove one of the active points, just do graceful shutdown. Works much better, much faster. Uh, so uh, as we discussed with uh, uh, Ross White, uh, overall complexity and scale is one of the surface, right? It's one of the variables. By reducing the amount of state, amount of prefixes, this will allow you to use a com completely disaggregated address plan as discussed by Dima, right? So it's your worst case scenario, but you know you are not going to black hole, you are not going to loop. So you need to define your scope and disaggregate within particular size or scope your disaggregation, which is usually a data center, which in most cases allows you to keep routes under control and your silicon as if today should support this number, right? Uh, so using fully disaggregated subset of routes plus default from one in most cases would work just fine. And if you lose connectivity to the one, the planes that lost this connectivity will withdraw a default route. So that's kind of on my side and stuff I've been closely working on over the last months. And uh, so if you have something to add, please do. Yeah, I would like to add that, uh, yes, uh, for the table scale, especially a uh, uh, single uh, unipass for the scale on modern, even like uh, electronic chip switches is really nice. Um, but uh, there are some other scaling parameters because even if you have uh, forwarding and routing tables with or can support uh, for the tables for hundreds of thousands of entries, that doesn't mean that we can modify them fast. Uh, it depends, uh, especially since hardware for the tables, uh, data structures are uh, sort of designed for fast lookup, but not necessarily for fast modification. And uh, what's really achievable is probably on the order of a few thousands to maybe 10,000 entries per second. So no, not only routing systems should be designed like scalable and nice with proper aggregation probably, but uh, it's better to be designed so a uh, rate of change is not too high. And uh, another thing is that since we are usually talking about uh, multipass routes inside the data centers, uh, resource involved are uh, longest prefix match entries, uh, ECMP tables, and ECMP next hop table. Uh, and if we test for the scale, uh, it's really important not to scale uh, to test not only in situation but also test for dynamic situation like uh, a lot of route injection and then route withdrawal and so on. One of the reasons is that what happens at least on some hardware when we modify a set of available next hops, it could be that new uh, ECMP group allocated and probably uh, like old group uh, block of next hop entries is not reused, but we allocate another block and so on. So a kind of garbage collection need to happen to uh, use all the resources. And it could be that in steady state or in like the rate of change is uh, really low, uh, we are very close to the uh, actually to the scale described in the documentation. But when rate of change is really high, it's possible that actual number of ECMP entries is closer to half, for example. We absorbed something like that on some hardware. Same here, so, and uh, also make sure you test V4 and V6 together. You might really see some surprising <laughs> numbers oh, yeah. when you need to update both. And try to use different uh, 
especially on I mean on IPv4 you are not going to see a lot of differences on IPv6 update rate for slash 128 versus slash 64 could be really really significant test it properly see what you have deployed is completely representing your test because again surprises could be really really nasty so I think it would be a good moment to stop for this episode. Yeah, yeah, yeah this is this has been a great discussion, and uh, I'm I, I think I've been in learning mode more than uh, host mode through all of this. I've jotted all kinds of notes down here, uh, just for myself and things to explore further. But uh, uh, but Dima, again, thank you so much for. Uh, for joining us today, and um, uh, and uh, and Jeff, uh, are we going to continue this discussion? We yeah, have... I believe it's not goodbye. It's see you next time. Oh, for okay, dinner. great. I was, I was hoping that was we would like to discuss. Okay, Thank great. You. Well, in that case, we'll see you uh, see you again in two weeks. Yes. Thanks, Dima. Thanks, Jeff. Thanks, see Robert you, and uh, Sean for supporting us. And we will see you in two weeks. Have a great day.